Hello and welcome to the vlog. It's bright and early and I'm on the move to get to the mouth of the tunnel for the first transit of the day. That's at 8 o'clock, although you don't find out if it's your side or the other side that'll go first until you get there. Meanwhile, someone up in those houses really likes swans. It's just half a mile or so to the tunnel entrance and I've a lot on my mind. It's going to be an interesting experience. The Hare Castle has something of a reputation. It's very, very long, almost 3,000 yards long. It is very, very low in parts. So low, in fact, they measure your boat before you go in. And it's one of the few tunnels on the system where there are tunnel keepers and a strict system for how you go. It's one-way traffic only, so they let a certain number of boats in northbound, and then when they're all out, they count them in, they count them out, they let a certain number of boats in southbound. Now it is very well looked after, so you might think this is the safest tunnel there is, but in fact it's quite a dangerous tunnel. Three years ago, a chap did actually die in the tunnel. He was knocked off the back of his boat when he hit his head on one of the low bits. It was a horrible story. He had his um, wife and son on board. They were sitting up front. They didn't hear him go overboard. And his body was retrieved something like eight hours later by divers. Now at the inquest, the coroner made various safety recommendations which have since been implemented, I believe. One of which is having life jackets on board. So I have in fact dug my life jacket out of storage and will be wearing it for the passage. But on the one hand, it sounds very scary. On the other, you have got the Canal and River Trust people there very carefully keeping an eye on what's happening. So it should be okay as long as nothing you know goes wrong I've checked I've got my diesel fuel that's fine I've checked my oil levels I've checked the weed hatch I've done all that kind of stuff I've done as much as I think I can so we'll just have to see what this experience is going to be like I've already lowered my solar panels as far as they'll go the latter one sticks up at the back because of an air vent underneath it and my TV aerial pole has been taken right off there's the tunnel entrance you line up on the right, there's one boat already ahead of me who's just pulling off the water point, I think, and two others coming up behind. We'll now wait here until we've had our safety briefing, horns and lights checked, and the tunnel keeper gives us the go-ahead. The white house above used to be the tunnel keeper's cottage, though the modern tunnel master has a brick shed to the left of the portal. Well, we've just been given our safety briefing. There are four boats waiting to go northbound. The first one is just going in, and there's a two-minute gap between each of us, which we're supposed to try to maintain. Wish me luck. Here goes, then. The boat ahead of me has already gone in and will set our pace. I'd like to do it quickly, if possible. Note the arched height barrier, which reflects the lowest point in the tunnel. If you scrape that as you go in, you must stop and come back out again because you won't make it through. The front of the boat is fine. What about the back? All good. Once we're all in, they'll shut the doors behind us and turn on giant ventilation fans. We're in, and it's all a bit foggy, but that's actually the diesel fumes from the boat ahead which are now being drawn down the tunnel and extracted out by the extractor fans, which you can probably hear. So they've shut the gates at the end to make that work. And I'm very carefully following the boat ahead, trying not to get too close or lag too far behind. The dot in the distance is not the far end of the tunnel. That's the rear light of the boat in front. See the vaguely fluorescent green arch? That's one of the sections where it gets lower, painted so that you can see it as you approach. And this is what one of those looks like from the steering position. There are several as it gets lower and lower. Here's the next. Each time you think, well, maybe that's the lowest point, and then another one comes along. That, for example, is distinctly lower overhead than before. Sorry about the water on the lens, the tunnel's very soggy in places. Starting to feel really rather cramped now, and unbelievably, there's another green painted arch coming up where it gets tighter still. 
You also notice how much less width you have too because you're up in the top of the tunnel. This really is low now. Look how close my solar panels are to the roof and... Oh, oh hang on, you're kidding me! Oh my word! How am I even managing to steer straight in this? I have no idea. But look at the rigid stare of concentration on my face. Look how close the roof is to my hat. That's the view above my head. It does eventually get higher again and wider too. Of course, this is still only a single width tunnel. I cannot express how much bigger it feels once you've been through the tight bit in the middle. Finally, some 30 minutes after we went in, and yes, that means we were making good time, you can see the light at the end. You have to squeeze over to the left here as it's a bit narrow when you emerge, but it's so good to see daylight again. Look back and just to the right, there's another tiny arch, the remnant of the original tunnel, for there have been three in total. So that was the Scare Castle Tunnel. Actually, a very interesting experience. Glad I wore the life jacket though, it was really cold in there and that extra insulation really helps. The water here is notorious for its orangey-brown colour. It's not mud, it's caused by iron oxide, rust in one of the tunnels quite the soup. As soon as you turn the corner from the tunnel exit, you go past a bridge over the entrance to the Macclesfield Canal. This turns and runs briefly alongside the Trent and Mersey, which I'm on, before then turning sharp right again and going overhead on an aqueduct we'll see in a minute. But I'm in need of getting my laundry done and there's a place just a short walk from here, so I'll pull in for a bit. Because I started out nice and early, and because we were the first boat through the tunnel, I have managed to not only come through the tunnel, but also get my laundry done, and even get in a quick Tesco shop as well, and it's still only quarter past 12, so now I'm gonna set off again and do another five locks, hopefully, which will take me to a place called Church Lawton, which is just out in the countryside on the other side of Kids Grove. That's the target. There are some moorings there apparently, but on the day like today they might be busy, I don't know, we'll, we'll find out. The long, long stretch of locks north of Hare Castle Tunnel is known as Heartbreak Hill, and I can quite imagine a coronary coming on if I do them all too fast. So I'll divide the journey up into manageable chunks, and in the sun, take it easy. That's the aqueduct carrying the Macclesfield Canal over the top of the Trenton Mersey. This next lock is next to a pub. That makes me nervous because if people are sitting outside watching what I'm up to, it often brings on a mistake because I do get self-conscious. Luckily here it all went without a hitch. At the bottom of the lock, on the right in that white building, are the Canal and River Trust's boater facilities. Water, showers, toilets and all that. The upside of these locks is that they are mostly in pairs, so not only do you double the chance of finding one that's set your way, but also I don't need to hold anyone up by being single-handed. They can just go through the other lock past me. I have a complaint though as a single-hander. On exiting the non-towpath side locks, Although there is a way for you to go back up to close the gates behind you, there's nothing on this side to tie the boat to while you do so. Now on this particular lock there's a central bollard and some metal steps up the wall I can climb. I'm not sure I'm supposed to be doing that, particularly as there's a large fence at the top you have to clamber over. It's a staggeringly beautiful day though, so I'm not getting too stressed about it. I'm almost inclined to whip out a quick picnic right here. Mopping the sweat from my brow, a quick look back over some of the locks I've just done. There's my boat, 
loosely tied on the towpath side while I run back to close the gates. And just while I'm banging on about it, here's another example. Left hand lock, so not the towpath side. A great little area for your crew to rejoin you if you have crew, or for me to step off and run back to sort the gates, in theory. There's even some steps up the middle, so going back should be easy. But there's nothing to tie a rope to to hold the boat while you leave it. And I'm darned if I'm leaving it untied, as the wind will just have it straight out into the middle of the canal. There's a lovely path. They just seemingly expect you to have crew and not be single-handed. I feel prejudiced against. Oh, it's fine on the towpath side, so all I have to do is manoeuvre over there in order to go back. I know there are greater problems in the world, but this kind of thing is what bothers me with boating. That's enough locks and tunnels and winches for one day. I'm calling it quits for now. Cheerio!